did it come to this? Australia, and a special welcome to our first, second, third and fourth year students. We look forward to seeing you back here with your smiling faces on Monday when we reopen the site and our communities back together again. Before we meet our very special guests tonight, a huge thank you to our recent guests, Damon Herriman and Susan Pryor and David Wenham, and we thank them for their terrific generosity and their industry know-how and passion and commitment to the profession. Uh, in the coming weeks, you will meet uh, a very special one of the dynamic duo of the Umbilical Brothers, David Collins. He'll be on, on this program, which is great. And then two weeks after that, live from Los Angeles, Harriet Dyer, a wonderful actress doing incredible things in LA, one of our graduates and one of our ambassadors. And then a few weeks after that, we're crossing live to New York City, where we'll see and meet and spend some time with Hugh Jackman, our patron, and a dear friend, which will be fantastic. So tonight, uh, it's my great privilege to welcome a guest who is highly respected, renowned, and a prolific filmmaker. He's a multi-award winning uh, director, writer, and producer. His numerous works uh, gaining both critical acclaim and commercial success. He is a gifted and passionate artist, and it's my privilege to welcome him to the program tonight. Please welcome Kriv Stenders. I do. Hey, how are you going? Good. Can you hear me okay? I can. I certainly can. Hey, when I grew up in Melbourne in 1977, I was a jobbing actor back then, uh, and uh, I was working at the cinema as an usher, uh, and I saw Mad Max a hundred times, and I saw Getting of Wisdom a hundred times, and I saw One for the Cuckoo's Nest a hundred times, <laughs> and, and I saw John Diagon's film, Mouth to Mouth, Australian director, and I was just mesmerized. And I fell in love with film back then. Um, what had you fall in love with film? What was your experience where you got that connected to it? Well, it's pretty close to 77. It was 75, 1975, and I was 11 years old. So you can do the math, everyone, work out how old I am from that. <laughs> <clears throat> I went to see, um, my father took me to the George Street Cinema in Brisbane, and we went and saw a film called Jaws. And it was the most incredible experience I've ever had up until that point in my life. And I came out of the cinema absolutely buzzing, um, like uh, just, just electrified by what I'd seen and by what I'd experienced along with all these other people. It was like, it was, it was a religious experience. And I went, wow, what did I just see? And then uh, how, how did that happen? And I read about this guy called Steven Spielberg who was a thing called a director. And then I started reading up about him and, and learned that he made movies when he was you know, 14 or 13 on Super 8 and became a director. And I said, well, that's what I'm gonna do. I wanna do that. That's what I wanna be part of. That's what I wanna do for the rest of my life. So it was pretty much nonstop since then. I found it amazing because I would uh, obviously be ushering and I would see people have the most extraordinary experiences in that cinema and the film, I saw things in the film I hadn't seen before time after time after time. And it wasn't that the film had changed, something had changed in me. And I was seeing different things in myself. I, I felt parts of the story affecting me in different ways. So it's an extraordinary thing, isn't it? How do you feel as a filmmaker? How, how do you capture the whole concept in your mind and your heart to make sure that you, you get to the finish line the right way? <clears throat> well, it's really... Um... I'm, I'm, I'm going to use a sort of analogy, a musical analogy, which I'll probably use a lot tonight as we talk, because I, um, I liken film and cinema very much to, to music. You know, it's, to me, they're very similar um, art forms. Um, and I think films are, are music, you know, but they're visual music um, and they're emotional music. And I always sort of come from everything, even when I watch a film or when, I, when I'm thinking about a film, I think about it in musical terms. I think about how do I want to feel at the end of this film? How do I want to, what, what do I want to feel during it? 
and it's the same journey you go through when you listen to a great song. You know, a great song has takes you places and makes you feel certain things at certain points in the song. So I always sort of tend to think of films as songs or pieces of music. Um, and that's really, and that's very, comes quite abstract is how does it, what, what, what color does it sound like? What, what mood does it sound like or feel like? So it's sort of a very intuitive process of, of thinking of films in this sort of, um, yeah, in this sort of musical way, I guess. Yeah. And I hear that you're very keen on VR. Oh, no, only in that um, I'm really interested in technology. I mean, I'm really interested in the way film technology is always evolving. It's always changing. You know, I've, I mean, I grew up, um, you know, I trained as a cinematographer, so I grew up with film, you know, and there was a large part of my life where 35 mil, shooting on 35 mil was the dream and the goal. But I've never really, I always felt like I always loved look of video. I always loved video and I always loved, and then when digital came, I went, well, this is something completely different. So I wasn't one of these film purists who said, you know, film's the only way to go. I kind of went with it. And the way I, I loved shedding film and moving out of film and get, getting into digital because it's a whole new canvas and a whole new set of colours. And VR is just another tool, you know, and I think what's interesting about VR now is that, that game engine technology is going to be really interesting for filmmaking because of the way it can now, we can have a lot more control over the way we can um, look at location shooting or, or studio shooting. So things like The Mandalorian and there's a lot of stuff that's online now, um, some free software now where you can track and blend these sort of 3D environments um, in your home studio. So to me, it's all part of one rolling, really interesting kind of evolution of technology. And as a filmmaker, as a bit of a geek who loves cameras and who loves tech, it's just part of that, that great sort of um, toolbox or toy box that you have as a filmmaker. And of course, you love uh, what I can read from you. You love working with actors, and that's a really particular skill that directors need to have. I mean, some directors come from a technical background only, but I remember seeing you interviewed uh, on um, Kill Me Three Times in Toronto in 2014, and you talked about a um, collaborative, fluid on-set environment uh, that um, that uh, was very collaborative and connected. And so, what do what drew you to that sort of way of working? Well, I mean, I don't know. You see, again, it's very, it's all intuitive. You know, to me, um, I'm going to keep these musical analogies going. <clears throat> to me, actors, um, and when I do my master classes, I talk about this a lot. I think actors are really, um, they're all, you, you guys are all instruments. You know what I mean? You're beautiful, unique individual instruments, you know. Um, some people are kind of guitars and some people are violins and some people are, are flutes and some people are, you know, so every actor gives you a very specific, very unique, um, I guess, sound or, or, or quality. And um, I've always come, I mean, I've always sort of had a natural feel for performing. I'm a bit of a ham myself. I love getting up and I call it drafting. And, uh, you know, I get up and kind of, and some actors find it really funny. Some actors really hate it. Like Guy Pearce really took me to task one day. So don't do that because I can't unsee that. But I just approach it from a very, I guess, you know, to me, it's, it's so much fun with playing, you know, it's pretend. And that's what I mean about the process. It's a very collaborative, it's a lot of fun. And it's like being in a band. It's like being in a band of musicians and you're playing music and you're jamming together. And you're finding the rhythms, you're finding the volume, you're finding the, the, the key, you're finding the, the, the tone, you know, it's all very, again, it's very intuitive. And, when, and you know when it starts feeling right, when it starts sounding, sounding right, and you know when it doesn't. And that's all I'm coming at. And then I listen a lot, a lot of it's also about um, feeling the room and feeling what the actor's not feeling and, and, and listening to them and just, you know, groping your way intuitively through it. I mean, I remember David Field once saying to me once, he, he did a, um, he ran a sort of a course once at, um, at some Screen Australia seminar that I was a part of. And he said, you know, talking about acting is like dancing about architecture, you know, or I should say, 
talking about acting is like dancing, dancing about architecture. You can't fucking do it. You know what I mean? So um, that really stuck with me. I went, you're right. You can't, you can talk about acting to a degree, but until you actually start doing it and feeling it, um, you sort of, yeah, you kind of lost at sea, you know, and, and, and a lot of it's just trying stuff and, and, um, and, 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 and working, working a way to communicate with your actors. Um, and that's not, and that's a discovery process, just like, just like meeting a person or falling in love, you know, you get to know them and you get to kind of work out what they like or what they don't like. So it's a very, yeah, it's a very organic, very natural, very human process. Mm. I think I got blamed for uh, David Field leaving NIDA because I was teaching improvisation at the time and we came out of my class on a Friday and I said to him, how are you going, David? He said, I just don't get it. I just don't get it. And he said, I don't fit in here. And I said, well, you don't have to stay. And he said, really? I said, no. And he went, I might fucking leave, I think. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't see him again. <laughs> so I got blamed for that. But, you know, he, he, it wasn't the right time for him and it wasn't the right environment for him and he's found a, such a brilliant way because his instinct is so strong i mean one thing i heard many years ago was that um which i've always believed is an actor can only do something if they believe they can and if they don't believe they can they're not going to be able to do it so uh, as you're talking about the collaborative process there's something that joins us together in flying the flag for the story to be told and everyone going we can do this, the cinematographer, the DOP, everybody, we can do this, the actors together. And I love that sense of community and communal connection, the collective, really, what you're saying. Yeah, well, it's a collaboration. I mean, that's the best thing about um, filmmaking or working in film or any, whether it's film or television, is the collaborative process. And, you know, you... It's like, again, it's like being in a band, you know, when, 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 when you're playing and the music's sounding right, there's no, there's no better feeling and there's no better outcome. Yeah. Is there something that you do? I know that in my classes, um, I set a certain atmosphere and a, not a mood, but an atmosphere that's um, conducive, but collaborative and connected. Um, when, when you go onto a set and there's 150 crew members and all sorts of things happening, is there something that you find you do that bring helps bring the actor into the moment that you can really work with them on set? Um, look, one thing I've found is that no actor is the same. Every actor is completely different. And the more I work with actors, the more different they become. So, but what is common is that, you know, ultimately there's a, um, there's, a, 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 I always think a film set such a, I always try and think of a film set as the best place in the, in the world, because it is, as I said before, it's, 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 we're here to play, we're here to have fun. And I really enjoy a very um, harmonious, very open, very relaxed set. Um, not that, you know, we're, we're kind of smoking joints and, you know. Heaven forbid. <laughs> chilling out, you know, no, it's, it's, you still got to keep the momentum going. And also, there's nothing better than sort of nerves as well and a bit of anxiety and a bit of fear to kind of motivate you. Um, uh, but what I, what I try and always, I guess, create is just a very relaxed um, uh, environment and where anything is possible and where, okay, I've got a plan for today, but, you know, um, we don't necessarily have to do that. You know, if there's a better idea, if there's a better, um, or if someone's got a concern or if there's, and usually there always is a problem anyway. Like today we can't shoot there because it's it, the door broke or the, that, that neighbor's not letting us shoot there because they suddenly, they said yes and last night they said no. So there's always some kind of catastrophe or crisis going on and you just manage that and you, you roll with that. And what I, what I think that's what's important, I think, for actors to just realise that we're all to get in this together and I've got your back covered, you know, that no matter what, We'll work it out, and I'll keep you safe, and I'll I won't I won't you know embarrass you. You know I'll let you I'll I'll, I'll do the best I can to, to make your work um, um, shine. So it's just this this sense of instilling confidence, and it's a bit like to me it always feels like every day I feel like I'm running a dinner party. You know I'm always having to kind of work out oh that person doesn't drink alcohol that's right oh, um, she really loves you know 
Chardonnay. So better, like, even though we don't drink on set or smoke and joints on set, it's more, it's the analogy is that you're always just trying to keep everyone um, happy. And, and what, what you realize pretty soon into a shoot is you work out where people are at. Some people are set and forget, you know, some actors are just great. Some need a lot of work, some need a lot of attention, some, some need to talk through stuff and that's fine. Um, and I'm just there really to sort of roll with the punches. So it's, it's sort of, yeah, it's just, it's very much about ultimately, it's about we're here to play, we're here to have fun. If we're not having fun, then um, yeah, then something's wrong. Something is wrong because there's not a lot of money in it often. So the fun factor is, uh, is a really important thing. Um, I remember just hearing you say about I've got your back. There's something really, I think there's something phenomenal about that feeling for a creative artist when they feel that someone is on their side. Um, not that it's going to be easy all the time, but that we're, we're heading in the same direction. Um, what, what do you do if, let's say there's an actor on set and they're not reaching the heights that you feel the, the story needs to reach or that the, the character needs to reach? Is there something that you do or say that can get them there if they've got a different impression? Yeah, well, again, it really depends on the actor and it really depends on what your relationship with them is. Um, and sometimes, well, most of the time I like to be kind of pretty, pretty transparent and pretty upfront and just say, look, I don't think we're there. I, I think you can go further. I think you can, you, you can, um, you know, it's, 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 you need to push harder. You need to work harder. Um, and it really depends on what the problem is. So I'll probably articulate it more like going, look, I think you can really, um, you can really feel this a lot more. You can be much more angry or you can be much more hurt or you can be, you know, um, it was, a, I'll tell you a funny story. Actually, I worked with a really brilliant actor called Cal, Cal, Callum Mulvey on, um, on, um, uh, Kill Me Three Times. And we, that film was financed very, very quickly. Or he came on a, a very, like at the 11th hour and we didn't really have a chance to, we only spoke over the phone on Skype about the character and we really didn't get a chance to rehearse. He literally arrived the night before we started shooting and um, it was the weirdest thing. It's only happened to me once or twice on set where he came, he did the block through and he did the first rehearsal and he did the character in a completely different way than what I thought it was going to be. He did it with this really thick, strong accent and it was so wrong, it was so not what I thought we were going to be doing or what I thought he was um, capable of. And I just went, whoa, that is so not right. And I just had to go, uh, just give me a moment with Callan. I took Callan away and said, listen, I'm going to be up front with you. I'm really, really, I'm so sorry, but that's just not the way, the, what, that strong accent is just too strong. And he went, and I thought, fuck, he's going to punch me in the face. <laughs> and he went, right. I said, no, all you've got to do is just bring it right back. Just bring it back to, to you and to, to the way, you know, it's, 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 you, 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 you've got such a great presence. And if you just bring it back and use your natural voice, it's going to be so much better. And he went, and he just kind of, he was really great. He went, and he knew we didn't have time to fuck around. And he just went back and then did it. And it was great and he was amazing. And that's a testament to how great an actor he is because he could turn on a dime within the space of five minutes and completely throw out this version of the character he had probably had in his mind for a few weeks and just was able to sort of build the character from the ground up on that day. So it was a very, um, yeah, that was a very humbling experience in, in, one, in one respect, but also sometimes you've just got to, sometimes if something's wrong, you've just got to call it. You know, because the worst thing would be to kind of let him do it for a day and then have the producer go, what the fuck is he doing? And then having to kind of change horses midstream or God forbid not do anything and then fix it in ADR and then it's a fucking mess. You know, sometimes you've just got to pull band-aids. Yeah. I mean, I know when I was um, I first began directing, I my, one of my faults was I wasn't honest enough because I feared my honesty <coughs> might, might somehow corrupt the creativity in the room. Um, and so things would, would sort of go along and I'd get frustrated. But I've, I found after a while, it's much better to say, I think what the story needs now is this. 
I think your character can really pull out the stops. I think the other character needs to know exactly what you're thinking and feeling right now. And this is the time to do it. There's something yeah. about that trust um, and that interchange between the creative artists that allows the arrow tip to stay forward all the time, not go sideways. Yeah, and I think that's your, your responsibility as a director. Is like, directors are like captains on ships, you know what I mean? They, they have to, if, if, it's, if it's sinking, they have to go down with it. You know, I've gone down on a couple of ships, you know what I mean? I've made a couple of films that have gone down and I've had to go down with them. But that's, but then you, you do, you make, you make ships that, that stay afloat and have great journeys and have great voyages. So, um, but that's the kind of trade-off. And as a director, you've got to someone to be prepared to be transparent and to maybe get a slap in the face or, and, and I've had, you know, I've had actors kind of, you know, get chitty at me, but ultimately it's for everyone's good, you know, and, and you're right. You, you kind of, it just gets worse otherwise, you know. Yeah. What, what are the qualities that you love in an actor when you work with them in rehearsal or on set? Like, are there particular things that you really are drawn to? Oh, well, there are things I admire. You know, there are things I, I admire screencraft, you know, stagecraft. You know, working with an actor like Richard Roxburgh is just, it's a, he's like a Rolls Royce, you know, he just, heavy suspension and he just rolls in and does it and stops on his mark and rolls off and turns and does, you know, and it's all humming and it's all wonderful and that's a great thing about an actor like him. Um, I just really admire people or actors who, um, I'm going to say this, it's something that I, I really discovered. Actors who know their bandwidth, you know, who really know, and I really believe all actors, like all of us, even filmmakers, directors, we have a certain bandwidth that we really, that, that we really work really well within. You know what I mean? And um, I love actors who know their bandwidth so well that within that, there's a universe of, of choices and of options. But it's still, it's still within a very specific kind of zone. I mean, Robert De Niro is a classic example, you know, of an actor that has just got a very finite bandwidth and plays within that and does extraordinary work. Um, and doesn't try to be everything for everything. You know what I mean? Um, and it's those kind of actors who know what their, who know what their limits are, um, as opposed to these actors who think they can do everything. And a lot of that's about going, yeah, look, you're great, but seriously, you're not really good at that. <laughs> or that, I don't believe that. Or that's not truthful. You're truthful here. And I think the key word is truth. What sounds truthful and what's believable. Yeah. I remember I was in uh, New York in 77 and I was lucky enough to get the, uh, the last seat for the final show of De Niro's debut on Broadway in a play oh, called yeah. um, Cuba and His Teddy Bear. And I was sitting in the front row and I was able to see De Niro strut his stuff for the first time ever on a stage. And he was quite amazing because he bought, he bought the ferocity he brings onto the film set, into the cinema world, onto that stage. But, but he worked with such detail and such clarity. And he knew, as you know, he knew his bandwidth so well. Yeah, yeah. And that, that's what all those great actors, all, the, all those, the Michael Caines, the Meryl Streeps, you know, the Kate Blanchett's, all of those guys, they know, they know their instrument really, really well. And they know where, they know how far to take it before it breaks or before it goes out of tune, you know? Yes. Yeah. It's, it's, it's that command of, of, um, of their limits. And I think that's the thing I always say to actors or to acting students when I do these masterclasses, that, 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 is you can't be everything, you know what I mean? And know what you're capable of. And celebrate that because that's unique to you. And that's what I as a director look for when I look at casting tapes. I look for what choices is this actor going to make within their range. And that to me is how I cast. You know, I go, wow, that person made some really interesting or made it one really interesting choice. And it's usually one choice. And it's a choice that always they seem to kind of they've made and they stick to it. They don't, they don't suddenly you know, do a hairpin turn and do something else. They yes. stay on, they stay on course, and they follow, they follow that note or that choice through right to its logical end. Yes, I mean it's one thing that I know when we're directing, uh, and Adam Cook's directing here at, at Actor Centre, and the other directors here as well. But what you want is for the actor to go full throttle, 
to not second guess themselves at all, to not hold it back in case it's not right, in case it's not appropriate, in case you don't like it. You go, what we want you to do is just put the foot on the accelerator and we'll help you work out, you know, how much gas you might need, but just to go for it and have that faith and that courage and tenacity. Yeah, and just commit, just, it's a sort of commitment. I mean, I've done some screen acting myself, you know, and, and it's very interesting being in that, putting myself in that place on the other side of the camera. And to me, you know, it, it just boils down to what, it's just a very simple thing. It's like, you're just lying. You have to lie really well. And you have to lie, you know, within what's, what's possible within you. And it's amazing what you can draw out of yourself when you just trust yourself to lie really well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I know uh, one, of the, one of the great American actors, I um, uh, forget what his name was. Um, I'll find it in a minute. But he, he said, um, the trick to acting is walk in, stand your ground, look in the eye, tell them the truth. That was his golden yeah. rule of acting. Don't, yeah. there's, there's no escape hatch. There's no window open anywhere. Just go and do it. Yeah, yeah, commit. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Good, we've got some questions coming in from the, uh, the students, which I'm just going to have a look at now. Um, oh, there's a very interesting one I just missed there for a second. Hang on. Oh, from Saro. Do you have your question there, Saro? Yes. Um, <clears throat> do you often have a complete vision of what you want your project to look like before starting it? Or do you find yourself kind of having to change it or make compromises or different decisions as you go? Um, yeah, I mean, this is what I like about the process is that, you know, you, you, you kind of enter a film with, you know, with an idea, you know, you, you have a vision, I guess, of sorts, you know, you, you, you know, you, you, and you've got to have a very strong vision. But what I enjoy is how that vision can be, how, how that vision gets adapted and informed by the process and by everyone's involvement. And you want to keep a certain part of that vision open because it's very important to allow it to evolve. It's just like growing, you know. You've got to you've got to allow room for things to sort of um, um, develop, and uh, I love that not knowing uh, process. But at the same time, you've always got to kind of know what it was that you were wanting to do in the first place. And there's always sort of an end vision. And again, I use the analogy of a song. You sort of know that you want to end up feeling like this at the end of the film. And you know you want the the outtake to be this, but then what's great is that obviously when you start working with people, it becomes hopefully better. Fantastic, thanks, Saro. Yeah, it's interesting that because um, a director many years ago, I heard them say to their cast that they don't know how it should be, but they'll know it when they see it, which allowed the cast to go, "We're not trying <laughs> to do what you want; we're going to find it together." You know. Yeah, yeah, it's um. And, you know, it's, 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 it's chemical. You know, there's a chemistry that happens. And it's alchemical as well. You know, there's, and there's things you can never predict that no one can ever predict that happen. And discoveries that you make, and everyone makes at the same time, you go, oh, my God, that was fantastic. And then you realise that informs everything else. So it's sort of, and then suddenly the film, not so much starts making itself. It starts, you know, you start feeling it, breathing it, smelling it, hearing it, you know, feeling it. It just starts to sort of, um, again, grow into something that becomes very familiar. And then your choices you find as you go through a shoot become much more accurate because you know when something's right and when it isn't. Yeah, absolutely. Really, then you do it at the start, yeah. Yes. James, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, why not? <laughs> <laughs> why not? Why not? <laughs> yeah, so, hey, how you going, Chris? Um, Hi. <laughs> What was the uh, most significant moment in your journey as a director when you thought, that's, that's who I am or, or that's what I want to be like on set? Oh, gosh. Um, well, it's really more probably the films I watched when I was young. It was a beautiful film I saw actually on, you know, on TV, on midday TV, a film called Day for Night, which is a beautiful 
French film directed by a brilliant director called Francois Truffaut. Um, and, um, you know, that's a, that's a film about filmmaking. It's a, be- it's a love letter to, to filmmaking. And, and he plays a director and he's the director of the film. So it's kind of a bit meta. Um, but just again, it was like, wow, that is such a, what a great job. And then I think the next moment after that was I, I got to work on a short film in Brisbane. Was, I was still at high school. I was in my last year at high school and I was making this film with these um, university students. And it was just such a beautiful feeling of being amongst these people and this community of friends making a film. And I went, this is the way I want to live my life. You know, this is just, this is just a dream. So it was those very early um, emotions and feelings I had that have always stuck with me. Um, and then the great thing about, you know, going to film school was I got to work with other students and I got to work on some professional films and I got to see other directors and other filmmakers work and that we had great filmmakers come in and talk to us and we watched lots of films and it just becomes this sort of love affair, this sort of this magnificent obsession that you just, um, you know, just keep on, you know, um, yeah, being in love with. Great. Cool. Thanks, James. And Bailey... Do you want to ask your question? Yeah, sure. Um, I just was sort of interested in um, sort of knowing if there are any uh, like skills or areas of interest that you would encourage like a budding filmmaker or uh, a young director to sort of go down or explore, like perhaps sort of unexpected fields of interest, like technical things or maybe more social aspects, psychological. Um. Uh, look, I, I, I'm going to kind of come up with a pretty um, straightforward answer. Um, I think the best thing you can do is make films. That's the that's really the only thing, and the best thing you can do is just do it, because by doing it, all of that will happen anyway. Um, not, not, nothing is better than actually doing and learning and making mistakes and learning from your mistakes and learning also from your discoveries and from the things that do work out and finding your own voice, finding your own relationship to the medium because you're all like actors, filmmakers, we're all unique and we're all got our own only, we're the only ones who can make the films we make. You know what I mean? So we've got each one of us has kind of got a universe of stories within us and a universe of emotions within us. So the sooner we kind of connect to that, the more we work out who we are and what we're capable of um and that's how i've kind of approached it i've been very lucky that i've you know i've been able to kind of work on films ever since i left um university and i went to film school and went straight into sort of making music videos and tv commercials but i've always been working with the medium always picking up cameras shooting stuff getting it seen showing it cutting it you know doing it all shooting cutting you know, working with the musicians, just getting, just getting salty, you know, is, is, is really the, the only advice I can give, really. Fantastic. Great. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Bailey. Um, Greta, you've got a question. Hi, how's it going? Hi. <laughs> I was just wondering... Do you prefer working with a larger cast or with a smaller cast? And what are the differences? Um, I love both. You know, I love working with a big cast. I love it. It's like a party. It's a lot of fun. Um, Like I just did this, I did a war movie last year or two years ago called Danger Close. That was a big cast. It was probably one of the biggest casts I've ever worked with. And there was another film I did called Australia Day. That was a big ensemble cast as well. And it's, it's just a great, again, a sense of community and um, and a lot of trust, which is which is really lovely. Um, and then I also love working with you know um, a small group of actors, and there's an intensity there that's that's really again very um, powerful. Um, it really depends on the story you're telling. I mean, I made a film called um, my very first film called Blacktown, which I made. Um, sort of self-financed. I made that with um, a wonderful actor called Mickey Owen and a beautiful kind of, he was a non-actor, but he, he was just a natural actor, a guy called Tony Ryan, who's since passed away. 
um, and we sort of semi improvised, and that was and we shot that over about eight months, and that was again a unique experience. So I don't have a preference. You know, I, I love I love both, and both have their own rewards. Right. Thanks, Greta and Louisa. Hi. Hey. Um, I just, sorry. Um, I was just wondering like, what your top tips were for like writing and directing your own work. Um, yeah, like I guess what have you learnt along the way that has been helpful in future circumstances and yeah. Um, well, I find writing, I actually hate writing. Um, uh, and I, I, I I, th I always find writing for film is really frustrating because films are films, you know. And um, I've sort of invented my own approach to writing, which is, um, it's like what I said before about just doing it. You know, you find your own language or your, your own craft. or the, You know, a script can be whatever you want it to be. Like, for example, Boxing, um, Blacktown, the film I mentioned before, I didn't really write a script. I wrote a thing called the script book which was um, sort of the story, the story fleshed out, but just in big print and there was no dialogue. But I always, I knew what the scenes were going to be. And, you know, I could do that because I was self-financing the film. But to me, that was a really pure writing process because I was just writing purely intuitively. And I wasn't behoven to sort of an industry standard of having to kind of write dialogue and, uh, and then it could become something else that becomes from down and then people then really criticise it and tear it apart. I just wanted to write something and shoot it. I didn't want to kind of live in this sort of limbo land of just, um, of this thing, because scripts are nothing. Scripts aren't books, they aren't films, they're these weird documents. So I guess my, my answer is really just find your own, I mean, there's a lot of really, there's a lot of, I mean, there, there are industry formats, I mean, you know, commercially you've got to kind of follow that. But creatively, a script can be whatever you want it to be. You know, um, if, if you're in charge of the project, um, it can be whatever you want to be. And then therefore, again, you can find your own voice and your own relationship to your writing. And, and again, there's nothing better than actually doing it and writing your own thing and writing your own thing in your own terms and then leaving it for a few weeks, coming back and looking at it and going, well, that works, that doesn't. And creating your own filter system and your own way of looking at your own work objectively um, but at the same time constructively so you don't paralyze yourself. So it's just the thing of working out again, training yourself like an athlete, training a muscle, training training all these things so you can sort of do 20 push-ups instead of five. You know what I mean? You can write five pages instead of one. You can then write maybe three weeks later, write 20 pages, you know? So just build your own your own rhythm and your own relationship to the process that's yours that's no one else's and that doesn't follow a rule book that's Thank great you. that's great thanks louisa it's so true what you're saying Griff, because um we've got a, a, a an engine inside ourselves we need to be able to um trust uh, and connect with and not be waiting for external forces or agency from elsewhere to take on our own sense of agency um, we've got a question also from Lisa. Are you there, Lisa? Hi. Um, I Hi. just wanted to know, um, because we'll be creating our own content eventually um, when we're short on work, um, what's normally the first thing when you're starting a new project, Where, what is the first thing that you do during pre-production and how do you get it set up? I suppose. Well, um, well, uh, this is depending. I guess it depends on what entry point we're talking about here. Whether it's something that's been written and it's been developed. Um, I guess that's what you're asking, is it? But yeah. Oh gosh, I lost my words. Um, yeah. <laughs> if you have like an idea for something and you have a project that you wanted to get started, um, what is normally the first step that you'll take? for yourself to be able to get the wheels in motion? Okay, I guess I can answer that question this way maybe, is that basically I, whenever I think of something or when I want to, when I'm trying to think of a project, I kind of tend to reverse engineer from where, what, what's been done before um, 
who am I making this for? What is it that I actually, what, what's the end product? What kind of get an idea, even though you, you sort of don't know what it is, like where do you want it to end up? Like what is it, what, what do, what's, the, what's the best outcome for it? What do you want it to be? Where do you want it to sit? And then look at whether that's realistic, whether that's practical, whether there is an audience for this. And the trick is I find the biggest decision you've got to make sometimes is know why you're making something and who it's for. Um, and, and then once you crack that, then you reverse engineer from there. And I think a lot of the time I try and think about, well, that's being done. What isn't being done? Or rather, what can I do within the means I've got? And that, that is almost the antithesis of the, where everything else is going. So try and, try and, when everyone's zigging, you zag. So try and think of something that, no one, you know, look in the other corner. Everyone's doing this. Well, what aren't they doing? Um, everyone's spending, making stuff this way. Well, what can I do with these simpler? It doesn't involve that. How can I be ingenious and clever? And I always find that's a great, a, a really great starting point is to get excited by something that perhaps hasn't been done before in a particular way and that has a uniqueness to it. And then everything else falls into place because once you've got that fire in your belly, that, that fuck, I've got to do this because this, this is really unique to me and to my situation to what I want to do. And I know, I know what I want this to be. That's the most important thing is to have that, um, to have that fire because you're going to then get pummeled. You're going to get fucking green. You're going to get questioned. You're going to doubt yourself. You're going to doubt this. That's not going to work. This isn't going to work. Something will work. That will work, but that won't, you know, and you've got to always have that fire inside you, that, that initial thought of why am I doing this? Who's this for? Why is it going to exist? Because that's the thing that drives you through all of that other bullshit and turmoil, which there will be no matter what. So you've got to kind of be stocked up, have that, have that fire, that metabolism inside you, that creative metabolism, really get it working. So it gets you through all of that, that, rough, that rough work. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, no, it did. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Uh, so, Kriv, we've got a question now from um, um, what can only be described as one of our more difficult students. Um, he graduated 15 years ago and we try and get rid of him every year, but he keeps coming back. Uh, we, we, can't, we can't seem to get rid of him. Troy, are you there? I am indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Kriv. How are you, mate? It's uh, Troy. I'm one of the tutors here at ACA. I did. My acting started at, at ACA. I now find myself back here as one of the tutors, which is a lot of fun. Um, I actually have a, 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 a little three-part question for you. I want to get them all out for you. One you sort of uh, slightly touched on, but I think it's a really good thing for the students to know. I think coming out of drama school with everything you learn as an actor, trying to have all these great ideas and choices and, and, and journeys through your characters and stuff, and then you sort of get out and, you, and what you sort of don't learn straight away is that auditioning is very different to being on set and acting they're two very different skill sets and it's that idea you sort of touched on saying you, you want to have a very strong idea and just like almost like one or two very strong choices that you want to sort of chase um so what, what is it that you look for when you're auditioning people um uh, that that sort of is is the the thing that stands out most for you i'm it's kind of it's sort of along the lines of what I said before, and I look at it like this. I look at um, I look at more what people don't do rather than what they do do, and I think it's more interesting in what actors choose not to say or not to do. Um, I, I'm, I, I see I, I see tapes sometimes where every line is kind of they're trying to give you a bit of this and a bit of that and a bit of this and do that, and then I'll throw in a bit of this and then I'll end up with that. I kind of go, well, I don't know what I've just seen. I don't, I don't know who you are. I don't know what you're doing. While someone who comes in and just is very, um, I guess, clear and clean and perhaps uh, not minimal, but just doesn't, isn't necessarily um, pushing themselves into the lines. They're just letting things happen and making, as I said, really interesting choices or a choice. Um, and and, and then, then, then that becomes kind of 
undefinable sometimes because so, so suddenly you'll see something you've never seen before or you've thought of that line being read that way and you'll look at it and you'll go, oh, no, that's not right. And then you'll come back and look at it again going, wow, that's actually really interesting. I never thought of it like that. And then you, it gets you thinking, and you think, this is an interesting actor. This is someone who's kind of, and then, then I'll meet with them. And if they, if they kind of, if there's, if there's a sort of like a volley, like a tennis ball that's coming back and forth and they react to what you've said and then you react to what they've done, then that's exciting because then you go, wow, this person I can direct, they can work with me. So it's just that finding that, that openness. But what I look for in those tapes is just that, that unique, something unique about the way they've chosen to either do something or not, or as I said, not do something. Yeah, yeah. I remember one of the, the, the first sort of roles that I landed, it was uh, the, the director had said it, it was because of, he, it was not what I'd said, but the listening. He watched me listen and he said the listening is, is what sort of did it. And he said, you know, I had a very sort of singular idea of what I wanted and then I just listened. And I think that allows for that, that sort of volley, which sort of leads me into the second part of this question because with the same director on set, um, some directors like improvisation on set and some directors don't like improvisation on set. And I remember I, I've always sort of been big on it myself. And so I got on set and the scene was going and I just felt all this stuff and so off I went on this sort of thing and cut off it went and then one of the other actors looked at me and just across the the, the bed and said uh, he doesn't like that um, and so how do, how do you so especially with the constraints within the um, time wise and um, monetary wise within the Australian sort of film and television industry how do you feel about sort of actors who bring sort of improvisation or do you use it um, on your sets look again it really depends on what you're making or what music you're making you know and I believe that the script if it's good script, it's like sheet music, you know, and a good script is, you know, the, the words on the page are notes, you know, and a lot of good scripts, you don't fuck around with that. You yep. do, you, you, you play the notes. Um, improvisation is good to a degree, you know, I love, I mean, I've made two films that were completely improvised virtually. So I come from a place of being very, very open to it. And I really like it. But they're, they're a very particular kind of film that, those, that, that, that they resulted in, that those, that those improvisations resulted in. Improvising, improvisation was the only way those films could be made. But then, for example, say, you know, a film like Killing Three Times, you know, that's about the musicality of the, the um, script. And you can't improvise that, you yep. know. Um, and then there's, there's sort of ad-libbing. And there's rolling with something in the moment. Degrees of that are okay, but kind of running amok over over the top of something very concrete to me is sort of not all. You, yeah. You've really got to, you've got to. And as I said, to, and I, as I say to a lot of actors or students, you know, um, what's very important are the the black lines on the screen. You know, the black on the screen, the words. But what's equally important is the white space. Yeah. Because the white space is also the vacuum. In which your performance exists and you've got to look at the page of the script in two like in, in in black and white you know it's, there's two dimensions to it and you realize there's an architecture and there's a, a good scripts have a really great architecture that, as an actor if you know it then you can play within that negative space you know what i mean but you've yep. always got the, the the text that keeps you that you fall fall onto and keeps you there so it's sort of a to dance yeah um so yeah, I hope that's not too esoteric. But. No, no, not at all. I remember, like, I, I learned very quickly. It's a good idea to sort of know your project, know your director. Um, and so I remember, like, a, a few later, a few days later on set, I at, at this idea I sort of had. I went to him, and said, "Look, do you mind if in this moment this sort of happens?" And he was very open to it. And so it was sort of that conversation sort of allowed for that. Um, and just the third, the third question, mate. Like I said, so with the students, I sort of say a lot. You know, watch this film because of this, whether it be the acting or the cinematography or the storytelling or whatever. So what? Um, um, from from your point of view, what what films should should young actors be looking at? What are your films that you'd recommend for young actors? Oh God, that's a tough one. Um, oh look, I actually it was really interesting. I watched it. I watched it the other night with um, my son, and it just blew me away how it, how vital it still is. And that's a film called Dog Day Afternoon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It came up recently. I mean, that film, my God, Pacino. I mean, I always thought he was a great actor, but I'm just really looking at it going, oh, my God, it is so, it's such an insane performance. And every role in that film is beautiful. Like, yep. it's just, you know, so many, um, uh, John, sorry, John Cazale is just. Cazale, yeah. 
as well. It's just just divine, sublime. Um, and, you know, it's a really heightened film. It's a really, you know, it's quite, it's not what I normally call great acting, but it's so consistent, it's so true, and it's so committed to what it is. It's And it's made, you know, whatever it is, 40 years ago, and it's still just as vital. So that's, that's, that's just one, because it's fresh in my mind. Yeah, cool. Great. Thanks, Troy. Um, Kriv, it's great spending this time with you tonight. Thank you so much. Um, how do you see um, the industry after lockdown? Like, what are your thoughts on how we're going to get the, uh, the carriages moving forward down that railway track? Yeah, well, we were having this talk just before we went online. Um, look, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic, you know. I think, um, I think we're in a really incredible position here in Australia. Um, not only, obviously, because of, you know, we've hopefully got the, 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 the virus contained, which is one, one element to it. Um, there are a couple of practical things that are going to happen, like insurance, I think, has to be sorted out. That's the big one. Um, and I'm sure there'll be all sorts of protocols. It'll become like, you know, air travel became after September 11, which has become a fact of life, that, you know, we'll have all these different ways of working on set. Um, but my hope is that it's a reset. It's like restarting the computer. It's going to really sort of really make us um, address what we're doing, why we're doing it, and who we're doing it for. And I think there's a number of things that are happening, and that were happening pre-COVID anyway. The theatrical system, the whole way in which films are being financed and um, and marketed is that's that's collapsed. That's being dismantled. That was already being kind of um, broken down pre-COVID, but it's definitely broken down now. And there's going to be a whole new, and there is already the streaming, and there's a whole new infrastructure that's coming in place there. But I'm, I'm very hopeful that, you know, I think one thing that COVID is teaching us is that, you know, we, we love stories. You know, we're hungry for them. We're human beings. It's, it's, it's our food. We need to be, we need to have stories in our lives, and we need to be able to um, both keep telling them and keep watching them. So I think the desire for, for, for stories is going to be, just as strong as it, as it ever was. And I think also the kinds of stories we're going to tell are going to be completely informed by how we've changed, how COVID has changed us. Not that we're going to be making films or stories about COVID or about isolation. It's more that I think we, it's really made us, I think, connect with a much more humane part of ourselves. And I think stories are going to be have to be much more than just being, you know, just banal entertainment. I think stories... The stories that will work will, will touch us in ways that now that you know this pandemic has, has changed us. So I'm very hopeful. I'm very optimistic. I think it's a very exciting time creatively, and I think the technology, as we hit on before, is is really exciting now. I think um, all this free software that's available. I think you know all all you guys who and girls who want to make stuff. Fucking, you, there's nothing stopping you. I mean, you know, you've got the tools. All you need. And all we've ever needed are good stories and good ideas. It really doesn't matter if you shoot it on Hessian or on video. It doesn't fucking matter. Um, tell your story in whatever way you can and whatever way you want to as well. Um, don't let anyone tell you um, what to do or what not to do. Um, in the words of the great Slim Dusty, I've just made a documentary about run your own race. Keep your blinkers on. Don't look left, don't look right. Run and run straight. That was his advice. <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic. And it's so true what you're saying. Like I was talking to a, a great friend of mine who's worked in the theatre all of her life. And she said, if, we, if COVID was gone and all the theatre doors were open, what would you put on? Do we want to go and see Hamlet? I don't know. Maybe we do. Maybe we don't. I mean, the stories will change because of our experience of this time, as you say. Yeah. Well, everything will be filtered. I mean... Hamlet will be filtered through COVID, even though it won't be about COVID. COVID will inform the way we look at everything. And I find that very exciting in a weird kind of way. It's like, wow, it's almost like it, it enhances your responsibility as a, as a storyteller. Yes. Um, because you know you've got to make something that means something, ultimately, really. Because I think we're finding, you know, life is, you know, has to mean something, you know. We think we thought it meant certain things. We thought it meant material wealth. We thought it meant 
material success perhaps, but once you take that away, you kind of go, well, there are fantastic fundamental things that have always existed. Yes. We've got um, three minutes left, and I've got a list of questions here, of which there are 10 that you don't know. Uh, and it's your chance now to choose three numbers between one and 10. Okay, three, six, and eight. Three, six, eight. All right, number three, what, <laughs> what three things bring bliss into your life? Sleep. <laughs> um, love. Um, and... Food. <laughs> Brilliant. I want more of all three. Brilliant. Uh, interesting you chose number six. Um, what is the biggest lesson you've learned from your child? Oh, God. Um, to, to, oh, gosh. I guess to, to, to pull my head in. <laughs> To not be as, to, yeah, to have humility, I guess, to just be humble. Oh. You know, I think, you know, you, you realise that, um, I always feel like that Sylvester, you know, the cat, Sylvester with the sun. Oh, father, the shame, the shame. <laughs> and I always feel like Sylvester, that's like, you know. <laughs> so I'm always, I'm always, I'm always humbled. That's great. That's great. And you, we've got to stay grounded. I mean, it's really important in this industry, particularly. Uh, and the final question, number eight, you chose, how do you deal with disappointment? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I think disappointment, if I can answer it this way, disappointment and failure, I guess, um, are really, it's really important. And in fact, you know, um, there's a positive to it. The thing about failure, the thing about disappointment is that the only thing that can follow it is success or is, you know, um, a solution or a, or, 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 or a, um, a way out. You know what I mean? Disappointment is actually the best thing for a creative person because it, it motivates you. It keeps you going. It keeps you um, grounded. And you've got to also realise that success is just as traumatic as failure. You know, mm -hmm. success isn't everything and you've got to have... It's yin and yang. You've got to have both. You can't have all of one and you can't have all the other. You need to have both and you need to live your life knowing that both are always going to be around. You know, that disappointment is always around the corner. But just as quickly, there's always satisfaction. There's always something great, you know, and it's just the, it's the dance of life. Yeah, absolutely. And it's the, it's the ability that artists have to have to manage themselves, to manage the spaces and places when disappointment is evident and when things didn't work out the way they wanted. And that's, as you say, it's equally as important as being able to embrace the success and the sense of achievement. It's 8.30. Crib, thank you so much for a fantastic hour. I've really appreciated it. And I'm sure you're gonna see, I've seen lots of applause coming up on the screen. I'm sure you're gonna see a lot of our students out there that are gonna be wanting to work with you because you're someone that uh, they admire and look up to because your heart's in the right place and you've got a vision for this industry and that's the most important thing. So thank you so much. Thanks, Dean. Thanks a lot, guys. And thanks for great questions, everyone. Thank you. Fantastic. Really, really enjoyed myself. Well, we'll be back online in two weeks' time and I want to thank Troy and Adam and Johan and Ethan and Anthony and everybody who's gone towards making all of these nights possible and we'll see you back online in two weeks. Thanks again, Crib, and see everybody. Thanks, guys.